First of all, happy new year to all of you. I think this is our first press conference since we've been in 2020. And it's going to be a busy year for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to a level sufficiently close to, but below 2%, within our projection horizon. And such convergence has been consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. We will continue to make net purchases under our asset purchase program at a monthly pace of 20 billion euros. We expect them to run for as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rates and to end shortly before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. We also intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case, for as long as necessary, to maintain favourable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. Today, the Governing Council also decided to launch a review of the ECB's monetary policy strategy. Further details about the scope and timetable of the review will be published in a press release that will come out at 3.30. The incoming data since our last meeting are in line with our baseline scenario of ongoing but moderate growth of the euro area economy, in particular, the weakness in the manufacturing sector remains a drag on euro area growth momentum. However, ongoing, albeit decelerating employment growth and increasing wages continue to support the resilience of the euro area economy. While inflation developments remain subdued overall, there are some signs of a moderate increase in underlying inflation in line with expectations. The unfolding monetary policy measures are underpinning favourable financing conditions for all sectors of the economy. In particular, easier borrowing conditions for firms and households are supporting consumer spending and business investment. This will sustain the euro area expansion, the build-up of domestic price pressures, and thus the robust convergence of inflation to our medium-term aim. At the same time, in light of the continued subdued inflation outlook, monetary policy has to remain highly accommodative for a prolonged period of time to support underlying inflation pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. We will therefore closely monitor inflation developments and the impact of the unfolding monetary policy measures on the economy. Our forward guidance will ensure that financial conditions adjust in accordance with changes to the inflation outlook. In any case, 
The Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation moves towards its aim in a sustained manner in line with its commitment to symmetry. Let me now explain our assessment in greater details, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.3% quarter on quarter in the third quarter of 2019, following growth of 0.2% in the second quarter. The pattern of moderate growth reflects the ongoing weakness of international trade in an environment of continued global uncertainties, which has particularly affected the euro area manufacturing sector and has also dampened investment growth. At the same time, the services and construction sectors remain more resilient despite some moderation in the latter half of 2019. Incoming economic data and survey information point to some stabilization in euro area growth dynamics, with near-term growth expected to be similar to rates observed in previous quarters. Looking ahead, the euro area expansion will continue to be supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains in conjunction with rising wages, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stand, stance, and the ongoing, albeit somewhat lower, slower, growth in global activity. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook <coughs> related to geopolitical factors, rising protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets remain tilted to the downside, but have become less pronounced as some of the uncertainty surrounding international trade is receding. Euro area annual HICP inflation increased by 1.3% in December 2019 from 1% in November 2019 reflecting mainly higher energy price inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to hover around current levels in the coming months. While indicators of inflation expectations remain at low levels, recently they have either stabilized or ticked up slightly. Measures of underlying inflation have remained generally muted, although there are further indications of a moderate increase in line with previous expectations. While labour cost pressures have, stre have strengthened amid tighter labour market, markets, the weaker growth momentum is delaying their pass through to inflation. Over the medium term, Inflation is expected to increase, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and solid wage growth. Turning now to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, growth stood at 5.6% in November 2019, broadly unchanged since August. Sustained rates of broad money growth reflect ongoing bank credit creation for the private sector, and low opportunity costs of holding M3 relative to other financial instruments. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 continues to be the main contributor to broad money growth on the components side. The growth of loans to firms and households remained solid, benefiting from the ongoing support provided by our accommodative monetary policy stance, which is reflected in very low bank lending rates. While the annual growth rate of loans to households remained unchanged from October at 3.5% in November, the annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations moderated slightly to 3.4% in November from 3.8% in October 
likely reflecting some lagged reaction to the past weakening of the economy. These developments are also visible in the results of the Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the fourth quarter of 2019, which indicate weakening demand for loans to firms, while demand for loans to households for house purchase continued to increase. However, credit standards for both loans to firms and loans to households for house purchase remained broadly unchanged, pointing to still favourable credit supply conditions. Overall, our accommodative monetary policy stance will help to safeguard very favourable bank lending conditions and will continue to support access to financing across all economic sectors and in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued robust convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer-term growth potential, supporting aggregate demand at the current juncture, and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural policies in Euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up <coughs> to boost euro area productivity and growth potential, reduce structural unemployment and increase resilience. The 2019 country-specific recommendations should serve as the relevant signpost. Regarding fiscal policies, the euro area fiscal stance is expected to continue to provide some support to economic activity. In view of the weak economic outlook, the Governing Council welcomes the Eurogroup's call in December for differentiated fiscal responses and its readiness to coordinate. Governments with fiscal space should be ready to act in an effective and timely manner. In countries where public debt is high, governments, governments need to pursue prudent policies and meet structural balance targets, which will create the conditions for automatic stabilizers to operate freely. All countries should intensify their efforts to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of public finance. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the Capital Market Union. We are now ready and available to take your questions. Thank you. Mr. Arnold. Good afternoon. Uh, happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, Martin Arnold from the Financial Times. I like your owl. Um, I have two questions for you. Firstly, um, trade seems to be the order of the, the day or the order of the week. Um, what do you think um, about the prospects of a potential trade war between the US and the EU? And does that seem more or less likely since the start of the year? Uh, and secondly, I'd like to hear your reaction uh, to Sweden ending its experiment with negative interest rates and whether you think that uh, markets assuming you don't have the potential to cut further 
um, and they're signaling that the next rate rise will be upwards rather than downwards. Are they correct in that assumption? So that's three questions in a row. <laughs> Okay, on the, uh, on the trade front, I think you, you're quite right in signaling that trade is actually uh, an important element in our considerations, and particularly in assessing uh, the downside risk. I think one critical development since uh, our last uh, meeting in late December has been the conclusion uh, of phase one uh, of the negotiations between US and China. And that in and of itself, uh, has um, a variety of consequences. Uh, it has consequences in relation to uncertainty. Uh, it certainly has slightly reduced, uh, if not vanished, but it also has consequences in terms of international trade at large and indirect consequences uh, for those uh, regions or countries around the world from which trade uh, will be diverted in order to deliver on that phase one. So this is something that uh, our teams are looking at very carefully uh, to assess exactly what will be the impact uh, on a net basis uh, for, the, uh, for the euro area. In terms of uh, the trade relationship between the US and the EU, I took some, some comfort from the meeting that was concluded a couple of days ago between the president of the uh, European Union Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, with the president of the United States. And uh, while we all know that uh, the results of those meetings are preliminary, uh, the tone and the determination on both sides to um, draw positive conclusions from that meeting and to indicate determination to pursue the, relation, to pursue the negotiations and the approach uh, to uh, the uh, trade relationships between the EU and uh, the US, I think, is, is to be taken as a, as a positive signal. Um, I know that the President of the Commission will be visiting the United States in February. I would expect continued uh, work uh, to be ongoing between the parties by then, and, uh, and hopefully some positive developments out of that February visit. But clearly we're going to monitor that very carefully and see what the, the, what the signals are uh, with, uh, with due consideration for the limitation of signals relative to what the outcome of final negotiations can be. Uh, in relation to... Um, the, the, the setting of rates, in particular by, by Sweden. I think the, I leave it to the, uh, the Swedish Central Bank uh, and to Stephen Ingers to actually indicate on, on what ground, for what reason, uh, there was a determination to actually uh, return, for the moment at least, uh, to a zero interest rate. Uh, my understanding of his conclusion is that there had been a positive outcome of that period of negative interest rates and drawing from that, uh, and given the economic circumstances, the, infl the inflation expectations, um, it was legitimate and their decision uh, to actually return to um, the zero rate where they are at the moment. Every region and every country has its um, idiosyncrasies and, and, and rational, and uh, I think comparisons in that respect are uh, odious, as we, as we all know. Clearly, everybody's going to look at you know, what uh, conclusions are drawn from, from that uh, monetary policy reversal, if you will, um, in Sweden, but I wouldn't draw any conclusion as far as our policies are concerned. And as I said very clearly, I think in the introductory statement, um, the Governing Council is going to be very attentive to any and all developments in all directions, uh, both in terms of growth, but obviously in terms of inflation, which is our measurement of price stability, and will take whatever measures are necessary as appropriate uh, in order to respond uh, to our imperative to deliver on our mandate of price stability. Mr. Sims? That was a bit of a long-winded one, but you had three questions in one, so it had to be long. Thank you, uh, President Lagarde. A uh, question about the inflation target. Do you agree with your predecessor that the inflation target should be viewed as symmetric? 
And I'm also curious about your view on the suggestion of creating a band around, uh, a target band around 2%. And then a question on the risks. Um, you said that the uh, risks remain tilted to the downside, but less so. Was there some discussion about uh, maybe saying that risks are now balanced? Um, on the uh, on the inflation uh, target, uh, we have um, we have a policy by which we operate. We have a, a strategy that was defined and that has inspired. Uh, the policy decisions that were made and that have been made up until this day and that will continue to inspire the policy decisions that are made until a strategy has been adopted, which is a while from now, but I'm sure you'll have questions about the strategy. And in that respect, I would just adhere to uh, what that strategy was, what its developments were over the course of time. I think the point of symmetry is very clearly referred to in the introductory statement uh, one con press conference after the other, so I would, I would refer you to that. Um, you very uh, gently um, nudge me into having a view as to whether there should be a band, as to whether there should be this, that, or the other. I'm going to refrain from that. I know that some, uh, some commentators would, would love me sort of uh, to disclose uh, my principles, my views, and my philosophy. I think it would be largely uh, unfair uh, to the strategy uh, review exercise that we are embarking upon as of today. I do have my views, as have other members. Uh, my, um, my mission as, um, as president uh, of the governing council is to harness all the views around and to make sure that we come to as close as possible a view that is shared by all in order to have as consistent and as effective um, a monetary policy in order to deliver on our mandate. So, as I said last time around, we're going to, to look at many issues. Multiple views will be uh, um, proposed. A lot of hard work is going to be put into the exercise, but I would not exclude, preclude, or anticipate uh, how we are going to deliver, because that's the point of our strategy review exercise. It's how we deliver. Now, you asked me about the, um, the, the, the risk tilted to the downside and how much tilted to the downside, but less so than uh, last time around. Uh, I think what, one of the key considerations we had on our mind was indeed the change in the level of uncertainties about trade and trade relationships and the expectations we have that those uncertainties will be uh, dealt with hopefully in the future with the same uh, type of approach, negotiations rather than adversarial positioning. Um, was there a discussion as to whether it was closer to balance than it was uh, tilted to the downside but less skewed than it was? Yeah, you always have those discussions. And that's, I think, um, completely justified uh, because of the very mixed um, picture that we have of, of the economy. If, if you focus on certain signals or if you focus on certain indicators or certain surveys, then you, you, you could have a, a, a less downside. If you focus on others, you could be a little bit more downside. So we tried to arrive at exactly what we thought collectively, unanimously actually, was the right level, uh, which was still to the downside, but less pronounced than it was uh, at our last press conference. We still have uncertainties, let's face it. Mr. Schwarze. Where are you? Would be your advice, your advice for German savers. Uh, they lost billions, billions of uh, euros. Should they buy shares, real estate, or should they spend their money? And they suffer from insecure pensions. What? should they do? You know, it, I wish I was a financial advisor, but in my position, I'm not. Uh, and, and I know that uh, Germany has, has plenty of terrific financial advisors, excellent bankers, and, uh, and uh, they will not be short of good advice to their, to their customers. I would simply say that 
the role of the European Central Bank and the euro system at large, which includes all national central bank, is to deliver on price stability. And uh, one of the avenues for delivery of that price stability is to make sure that, uh, that there is growth of our economies and that that growth is sustainable and, and solid. The study and the work that has been done internally at the ECB demonstrates that because of the monetary policy, including very low rates and possibly negative rates, because of that monetary policy, millions of jobs were created throughout the euro area. Growth was higher because of that. So that, that's, that's a very, very strong um, argument uh, to explain why monetary policy had to be what it is. As you have noted in my introductory statement, and I don't differ from my, um, uh, my predecessor on that front, I think having amplifiers of our monetary policy by having the right fiscal policy, be it by way of additional spending or reduced taxation for those countries that have the space to do that would certainly help in that regard. Mr. Vacour. Jean-Philippe Lacour, Agence France Presse. Bonjour, Madame la Présidente. I will follow up in English. Um, I have a question on the strategy, because at the beginning of your tenure, you said, uh, you know, I want to dust off the language of the bank to help the citizens to understand what uh, the bank uh, is for. And now, you know, the most citizens, are they savers or are they borrowers? They have just one thing in mind. When will the ECB raise the, right, the, the rates? And the, the one announcement you are doing today is, yes, we will launch a new strategy. So um, could you maybe explain now, right now in simple words to these people, why is it so important to review a strategy? Um, because maybe it's not very evident for them to, to understand this uh, long distance exercise. Um, and my second question is, so, uh, question on, on Davos. Yeah? As, uh, you, when you were a managing director of uh, IMF, uh, the world was waiting uh, at your verdict on global growth at the opening of Davos. Now you are flying to Davos after this presser, but a bit at the end of the journey. And uh, my same question, will it be not uh, accurate to skip the, the January uh, uh, presser so you and the member of the GCs ha uh, will have more time to spend uh, to, in Davos and, and then uh, meet the, the, the elite and the VIP of the world? Because uh, it will be the same each year. I mean, the calendar is, 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 is like it is. And maybe more generally, uh, do we need eight pressers then per year? Because a, lo a lot of uh, analysts think, uh, when, when you see the previews of the analysts, uh, it is often written, no change, no change, no change for this year. Could be uh, uh, different in the future. But um, would it be something maybe the strategy will discuss on the, the frequency of the, the monetary uh, policy meetings mm -hmm. with the presser? Thank you. Well, first of all, you know, our regard, our governing council, our deliberations, uh, our scrutiny of the economy and our determination to deliver on price stability as our mission and my mission. So yes, there are very interesting phenomena going on in the world. There are great conferences and great seminars to attend. But when something as important as our governing council meeting is scheduled, I don't see any reason why we would change it. Uh, we will see whether next year, the year after, and, and, and so on and so forth, whether we need to reorganize the timetable. But at this point in time, frankly, I think it would have been um, unwarranted, to say the least, uh, to change anything. That's point number one. Point number two, on, on the scope of the strategy. We are going to review um, a whole host of issues. So yes, it will have to do about uh, how we deliver, um, how we measure, what tools we have, um, and how we communicate. And it will really encompass the entire communication uh, approach uh, when it comes to decision making, 
to uh, publication, to the use of language that we have, to the uh, outreach, to the engagement with all stakeholders, all of that is going to be part and parcel of the strategy. So it's a broad exercise. And I think it touches on your first point. My commitment was really to be able to listen to the expectations of the people, to better understand their economic concerns and their imperatives and how we can deliver on them. We will continue to benefit from the work of the researchers, of the top-notch economists, of the, um, the academics. And, and yes, their views will be harnessed at various events that will take place in the course of 2020. But it is also going to be our task and our goal to listen. That resonates with those of you who know uh, how the Fed has organized its Fed listens. Uh, we, we, we will be different because you know, 19 uh, member states do not all speak the same language. And if we want to reach out to people, we are going to have to use um, people's language, I mean, literally. Um, and it will involve all the national central banks, which will be uh, also active participants in, in the process. But that's what I mean by including, reaching out, and addressing the concerns. Now, I take your point about the interest rates. And I think that I have addressed that point earlier on by indicating that we have to use all the instruments that are available and that are proven to be effective. We will measure effectiveness, by the way, uh, in order to deliver. Ms. Locke? Carolyn Locke, Bloomberg. Uh, President Lagarde, you've said before that the review will last until the end of the year, and assuming that that's still uh, the valid assumption, how do you plan to mitigate risk in the interim about uh, creating uncertainty over the ECB's policy, since, since the policy implications of the review are not yet clear? So, for instance, is the view that the ECB can't or won't raise or cut interest rates uh, as long as the review is being discussed justified? Um, and my second question is about tiering, um, especially since the next reserve maintenance period is in six days. Um, I'd like to know what the ECB has learned from its experiment with tiering so far since September, whether you're satisfied with the impact on bank profitability and lending and money market rates, and whether what you consider the costs and benefits to expanding the pool of exempted deposits or, or raising the rate on, on them. Thank you. You know, I have a, a very um, simple-minded approach to uh, your first question. It will be over when it is over. In other words, we will have a new strategy when we have concluded the exercise. Our expectation at this point is that it will take a year, and our hope is that we can uh, agree on that uh, new strategy of the European Central Bank around November, December. December, in my view, would be the, uh, the, the probable date for, the, for the, uh, the conclusion and the communication of our strategy. But when I say it will be over when it is over, what it means is that in the meantime, irrespective of our deliberations, our consideration, our engagement with academics, with uh, economists, with civil society, with European Parliament, and so on and so forth, irrespective of all that, which will progress in parallel and will keep a lot of people busy, both here in Frankfurt and in the 19 national central banks, we will conduct the same usual exercise of monitoring, analyzing, drawing conclusion about the macroeconomic situation, about the monetary situation, about the markets, because we look at that as well, and then we will draw our conclusions, which will be independent from the strategy review that we're conducting separately. Oh, you had the second question. Yes, the theory. I don't think I'm disclosing any secret because at the time some of you commented about it. There were some uh, governing council members that were a little bit skeptical uh, about the effectiveness, the benefit 
the justification of the tiering. I think the overall view, um, I think it was unanimous actually, I didn't hear any, anything to the contrary, but the unanimous view is that the tiering system is operating extremely well. There is no discussion at this point in time uh, to change the limit uh, of six times, as you know. Um, but, you know, since September, or since it was decided, and as of the effective date, as you know, there was instant movement, uh, it, it has proven to be, uh, to be effective, no question about it. Ms. Weisbach? President Lagarde, um, Annette Weisberg with CNBC. I have a question on climate change because you said early on that you want the ECB to play a pivotal role in fighting climate change also um, during the, the strategy review or including that in the strategy review. Um, what does that mean concretely? I mean, what kind of things do you have in mind? And then one other aspect you were saying as well that you want to bring the ECB closer to the people. Um, if we bridge that to inflation, there's a big gap between how people think inflation is actually developing and how inflation is measured in terms of people feel that inflation is a lot higher. Would you also include real estate price development in a new inflation measurement, perhaps? Thank you very much. On the, thank you very much for uh, your two questions. On, the, um, on climate change, what... I said, I said, and will continue to say is that it is everybody's responsibility, wherever he or she is, uh, to see what he or she can actually do to fight climate change and protect biodiversity. I, I'm, I insist on the two components. So let me tell you what we already do, because it's not as if, you know, it's a, it's a newborn baby because I arrive. Uh, quite a, a lot had already been undertaken, and I would refer you to an excellent speech that Benoit Curé had given back about six or eight months ago uh, about these topics. So I'll just, I just want to summarize what we do, because there's always questions and, and, and sort of uh, testing of her views versus the rest. Things are actually happening, first of all. Uh, we have, as you know, an ECB staff pension fund. And I, I'm looking at my paper because I don't want to give you anything that is wrong. So we replace the previous benchmarks for the equity funds by their low carbon equivalents. And that came on the top of the selective exclusion and proxy voting guidelines that have already been in place for much longer than me. But that's an add-on to what we had in place. It does not um, apply to a very, very sizable amount. It's roughly 1 billion uh, euros, but you know, small rivers make very large um, oceans eventually when they're protected. Um, the second uh, deals with the, uh, the ECB's own funds portfolio, and that applies to uh, the uh, ECB paid up capital and the general reserve funds. Altogether, that's roughly, that's a little over 20 billion uh, euros. On that, we are investigating how climate change-related considerations can be better integrated than they are at the moment. And as a first step, we have decided to increase the share of green investment held in the portfolio, subject to availability and liquidity of such funds, of course. Now, the third step uh, has to do with uh, our monetary policy portfolio, which is much larger. And as you know, there is only a portion of that which is in corporate, um, corporate asset purchases. It's roughly, take it or leave it, 200 billions relative to over 2 trillions for the entire um, asset purchase program. I think on that, the strategy is going to have to review what, it can, what, what, what the bank can do, should do, uh, how much it collides with the mandate. And if so, I think we should, we should very expressly say so. But if it doesn't, I'm giving you a for instance, it's not something that has been opined upon, that has been considered at all, but you know, you can, you can look at uh, what uh, ESG, for instance, criteria are respected by the issuers. You can assess the value of collaterals in order to determine what is the risk associated with collaterals and so on and so forth. So those are just you know, a few areas. In addition to that, there is work also that is ongoing uh, in various departments at the ECB to make sure that the climate risk is actually 
embedded in the work that they do in terms of risk assessment, uh, in terms of uh, models, in terms of uh, their forecast. Um, and, and, you know, this is work in progress. It's not something that is completed and that is, that is uh, uh, finished. I will myself finish with the, uh, the, area of, the area of financial stability because there is also work going on in order to define better stress testing. Uh, and that um, framework normally should be completed at the end of 2020 at the latest. This is work that is internal to the, uh, to the ECB and that is separate from what the SSM is doing as well separately. Uh, we also have, together with the European Systemic Risk Board, we have a pilot framework uh, that is an, under review as well and which should be completed as well in the fall of 2020. So there, there, is, there is a lot going on. And uh, as you will see in the uh, press uh, release that you receive later on, uh, in a very short while actually, uh, you will see that environment sustainability is captured very well uh, in the description of our uh, strategy review. It's right in their second bullet point. Oh, you asked me another one? Oh, yes. Real estate. As I said, we will not um, leave any stone unturned. And how we measure inflation is clearly something that we need to look at. Are we going to resolve the issues? I doubt it. Um, you know, clearly the issue of housing and the distinction between the home owner occupancy versus the non-owner occupancy, uh, the reality and the perception, the difference between large urban centers and, uh, and rural areas, all of that is, is infinitely difficult to apprehend and to, and to calculate, but we need to look at it and we need to understand. And if we believe that there is a clear miscalculation between what is there, which is roughly 6% of budget, if I recall, and, and what is the perception, we need to understand why. And if there is a real difference, which there might well be, then we need to pass that on to Eurostat and have Eurostat do further and additional work. I'm not suggesting that it's going to be resolved in one year. I, you know, when I was finance minister in France, we had our issues with the value of real estate and it, it, it took a lot of time. Mr. Fairless. Uh, Tom Fellows from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Madame Lagarde, I had a follow-up question on negative interest rates. It seems that there's growing skepticism within the governing council about the side, of, uh, uh, the side effects of having interest rates below zero for a, a long period of time. We saw in the minutes from the last, from the December meeting, there was some discussion about this. Was that discussed again today? Is that, um, are, they, are they concerns that you share that uh, negative, negative rates could have been in place for five years already and could be in place um, for, for years into the future. Are you concerned about the, side, the, the, the impact of that on the economy? Um, the second question was um, how you view uh, negative rates compared with QE as a stimulus tool. If the, if the Eurozone economy were to slow during the course of the year, which, which tool do you think um, you, 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 know, you, you think you might be first, the ECB might be first, might turn to you first to, to stimulate? Thank you. Um. Am I concerned? Um, I'm concerned about low rate because low rate is predicated on low growth, um, and um, you know I would much rather have much higher growth, higher rates. Um, this this would be a really nice problem to have to deal with, but this is not the situation we have at the moment, and. Um, you will, you will see that as part of our strategy review, we are going to look at the, side, at the potential side effects of the current circumstances, which are low rate. I mean, let alone negative, but they are, they, we have had low rates uh, for a period of time. And that hampers our ability to respond in case of um, exogenous uh, shock, as you know. You know, slow growth, um, I think we'll cross that bridge when we have to cross that bridge. But as you also know, uh, different tools apply to different portion of the yield curve. And we, we will 
Let's hope we don't have to do that because growth doesn't slow and growth continues to not only stabilize but accelerate in, in, the going, in the going future. That would be a nice problem to have to deal with. But if it did not, then we really have to ask ourselves at which end of the yield curve we want to operate. And that will determine which kind of instrument we, we, we want to use. Mr. Ewing? Thank you, Jack Ewing from the New York Times. Uh, Madame Lagarde, I have a, another uh, climate change question. There was uh, the, the Bank for International Settlements published a report at the beginning of the week. The, the vice president, in fact, wrote a forward to that. And I wondered if you had had a chance to look at it, if you had any uh, reaction to it. The, the main takeaway, I think, was that climate change is a, a threat to financial stability. And I wonder if you agree with that premise. I, I mean, I, I gather from your earlier answer you do, but I would like to uh, perhaps your clear statement on that. Uh, and then secondly, a uh, related question is, uh, will the ECB wait for the strategic review before it in incorporates any uh, sustainability or climate change criteria into its monetary policy? In other words, would it uh, wait to adjust the corporate bond purchase program uh, until the strategy review has reached some kind of conclusion? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it, you know, it's difficult to disagree with that finding of the uh, BIS that climate change is actually uh, a threat to financial stability. And, uh, and what's more is that it's a threat and a risk that is uh, hardly measured and taken into account by many, uh, many actors. I believe that the action uh, taken by the, the Suggested by the BIS, the action recommended by other central banks, I can think of Mark Carney for the, from the Bank of England, for instance, uh, are completely justified. And uh, I was personally very pleased to see that the private sector is actually also taking action in that, in that respect and uh, um, certainly would welcome uh, the involvement of other operators, including the accounting firms and those that are setting the international accounting standards. Uh, as well as the, uh, the the large asset managers, as as we've seen, I think we we badly lack uh, harmonised measurement systems that can be uh, generally accepted and and that are actually implemented. So that's uh, it is more of a personal view, if I may say, because it has not been debated uh, in the governing council, and I'm 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 not suggesting that uh, you know I would uh, and you know sort of give you the, the ECB doxa on this matter. I would be surprised if they were very much uh, against that. That position. What I tried to do when describing for you what we were already doing uh, was to show that while we might not be ahead of the curve yet, uh, we are not um, sitting on our bottom doing nothing. So we are taking climate change into account in order to improve the way in which we operate at the moment. And wherever we have the option to include climate change as one of our tools, uh, we, are, we are doing so. It is going to be an important matter that will be debated during the strategy review. What impact does it have? What consequences should we draw? Where does it um, uh, impact the way in which we, uh, we operate? All, all those questions will have to be debated. Mr. Siak Kantaris. Thank you. Mr. President, the last strategic review addressed uh, an era where inflation was hard to tame, not hard to stimulate. And since then, technology, globalization, even European integration have added efficiency but have undermined the uh, inflationary uh, pressures. How can this strategic review address with this fundamental uh, shift and what yardsticks do you think personally should be assessed first for their relevance in today's era? Uh, and a follow-up question, we can safely assure, uh, assume by now that uh, uh, ultra-low yields have not uh, been enough of an incentive for governments to, for fiscal spending for growth. Is there something more efficient, uh, different that the ECB could do or influence in order for, uh, to catalyze fiscal expansion or would it be considered too political? Uh, how central do you expect this issue to be in this strategic review? Thank you very much. 
You're completely right in that the situation has, has completely changed from 2003. And uh, as uh, you know, we, we published a study just before uh, December that, that sort of takes stock of the last 20, year, 20 years of, of euro um, use and implementation and monetary policy uh, delivery. For 10 years, the goal was to fight inflation because inflation was way too high. And then the financial crisis was the pivotal point at which you know, eventually inflation was too low. So it's, it's been a reversal of, of the situation and requires, in my view, that we actually look at the strategy very carefully to see how effective we can be in view of the change of circumstances, some of which are structural factors that are here with us to stay. When you look at the aging of population, when you look at the low productivity, these are probably going to be with us for a long time. So we need, that's, you know, that justifies fully the need for a strategy review. We cannot operate as we did back in 2003, which doesn't mean to say that we have to necessarily change this, that, or the other, but we have to look comprehensively at the effectiveness of our monetary policy. One thing that I know is central and anchored in our considerations will be the mandate that we are given under the treaty, which is that of price stability. That's the primary one. On, on fiscal expansion, I would first of all observe that at the euro area level, there is a very mild fiscal expansion as we speak. And I would also observe that um, two of the countries that have fiscal space, and I can think, you know who I'm talking about, um, two of those countries are now seriously looking, one has certainly gone pretty way out in order to explore how to expand more fiscally with their respective domestic budget. So there's progress. We just need to all keep at it, not because I want to influence fiscal policy. It's for the budget holders to decide. It's for the authorities that have competence in that respect to decide, but simply because a good fiscal support would give much more effect to our monetary policy. That's why I think it's, it's important that they do. Mr. Malin? Jan Malin, Handelsblatt. Um, I have one question on climate change. Um, you have raised quite high expectations on the future role of the ECB on, in the fight against climate change. Do you not um, fear that it will be difficult to, to deliver on that? And my second question is on policy making. Um, broad consensus in the governing council has some obvious advantages, um, but it might also ha uh, have some disadvantages like groupthink or um, the ECB might be vulnerable for for mistakes. Um, for example, the Bank of England tried to, to have people in their monetary policy committee who challenge the view, existing views in, in the, uh, within the group. Um, so how important is it f for you to reach unanimity or broad consensus, consensus in, in important monetary policy decisions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, on, on climate change, um, I know that we will have a debate. And I know that there will be discussions, and, and it's already out there, that debate. Is there going to be a mandate creep? Uh, isn't that going to be a distraction? Uh, why should it be the role of central banks? If they do so, then yet again, the legitimate authorities to implement climate change uh, policies will feel that job is done, they don't have to worry. I'm, I'm aware of all that, but I'm also aware of 
the danger of doing nothing. And I think that, you know, failing to try is already failing. So we should at least try to explore every area where we can actually participate in a determination that is now the determination of the European Commission of many of the Euro area leaders and which is now also creeping into the private sector. <clears throat> so that's my, my personal take on that. And I was very pleased to see that the environmental sustainability has found its right space uh, in, the, uh, in the monetary policy review that we are embarking upon. On the, uh, you know, I, I draw a line between um, consensus building and uh, repressing alternative views. And I can assure you that we are not short of alternative views, right? There are multiple views around the table on multiple aspects of monetary policies. And, uh, you know, I'm not a despotic president of uh, the governing council. All views are welcome. All governors have their space and time uh, in order to share their perspective and submit uh, their views. But at the end of the day and at the end of the process, we still have to complete the introductory statement and release a monetary policy decision if and when it is expected and required. So I don't think it is repressing views. I don't think that it is sparing alternative views. I think it's intended to arrive at the best possible common understanding and a final decision. If we have unanimous decision, it's, it's, it's satisfactory. It means that we are converging altogether towards a decision. But it may well be that we do not have unanimous decisions and that at some stage it will have to be a majority decision. But we need a decision. Mr. Bauer. Alessandro Ribera, Daily La Stampa. Uh, Madame Lagarde, next week uh, the uh, United Kingdom will be formally out of the European Union and it starts a complex time to the exit. So do you think the European financial system is ready for that? Are you worried in some way for that? You know, it's, it's one of the questions that I've asked um, the teams. What happens when Brexit happens? Are we all ready? Have we taken all the steps that we had to take? Have we alerted sufficiently uh, the private sector operators to themselves take the right measures? And my assessment today is that, yes, we have. Uh, just to remind you, back in March of 2019, we activated swap lines with the Bank of England to make sure that on both sides of the channel there would be enough euros and sterlings so that operations could uh, continue in a smooth manner despite the implementation of Brexit. We have alerted and reminded the banks of all the, necessity, uh, the necessary um, measures that they have to take uh, in order to be in a good position to continue to operate irrespective of Brexit. And we have reason, you know, good, good reason to believe that this is, this is so. And don't forget that you know, there was this high-level uh, working group between the Bank of England and the ECB at the level of uh, pres both uh, president and governor uh, in order to make sure that they had checked all the box and, and uh, um, covered the potential risks. You never know. There can always be a risk somewhere. But I think that in, in good conscience, we have looked at, at everything that uh, we thought was necessary. And the final question to Mr. Gurna. First of all, Happy New Year also to you and to all your colleagues of the ECB. Uh, also one more question for the climate change. Uh, in uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum, President uh, Commission Ursula von der Leyen said uh, how important the fight uh, for Europe against the climate change is. And the Bank for uh, Settlements uh, said it is the same view, but we are against a green QE program. What is your view on this issue? I very strongly support um, the President of the Commission in that respect, and in many respects for that matter. Um, we are taking steps, and we have taken steps already in order to um, play the role that we should play concerning the fight against climate change. 
Uh, we will look, as part of the strategy review, at what options we have to be even more intrusive, more active uh, in relation to the corporate uh, purchase plan that we have in place and which continues to operate, as you know, because uh, we are purchases uh, on a monthly basis of 20 billion euros and we reinvest as, as instruments come to maturity. Uh, we, we will look at that and uh, see how we can play our role in accordance with our mandate, indeed. On that word, I think, in accordance with our mandate, indeed, we have to stop the exercise. It's a perfect ending. Thank you very much. <laughs>